welcome to, I guess, what is probably my first ever YouTube video. So thrilled to be here with my brand new bestie, Hank Green. Hello! <laughs> We've known each other for 24 hours. Yeah! So, today, fitting into my specialty of my research, we are going to be answering some of your fish questions. And we have a lot of them, so we'll see how many we get through. Alright. Ready? You're making a YouTube video, Jada. Ah! <laughs> first one. Someone told me... Blobfish don't really look like that. Oh. That one picture everyone has seen of the blobfish. What's up with that? I love this question. Do you have input? Blobfish don't really look like that. They don't. But, Not in real but life. they don't look gray either. They look significantly more normal than you would expect them to. Sure. But they don't look exactly like completely normal fish. <laughs> they don't look like melted ice cream. That is like the main right. thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the, this is the thing. Imagine someone took you and brought you two miles deep into the ocean, you're also not going to look good. No. You're, you so look bad. like a blobfish. You have a deep sea organism and you bring them up to the surface. All that like pressure in the deep sea is like helping to give their body structure. And then you've taken all of that structure away by bringing them to the surface. I think it's very hard to realize the significance of that pressure. Right. It feels like two ways at the same time. First, it's like, oh, you're telling me that you actually experienced the weight of all of the water on top of you. Water, very, it's a very heavy thing. I yes. don't know if you've ever picked up a five gallon bucket of water, but it's heavy. My first thought is, oh, it's so nothing can live down there. But no, they equalize the pressure inside and outside of them. They're like pressure that is that is pushing out from the inside of their body to, to push on the pressure from outside of their body becomes like an extraordinarily pressure outward. Yes, there are animals that go from the deep sea up to surface waters, but they're not doing it in the time it takes you to like reel in a fish or like pull up a trawl net. And it also is like, I, I have no idea what's happening. How am I moving upwards when I am not moving myself upwards? It's very weird, <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sure, as an experience. I imagine that's what babies feel like when you just like pick them up and start moving them and they're just like, I guess this is where we're going now. I don't know. <laughs> I think about that sometimes. It's like dogs in elevators. Yeah, I, they're like, oh, I, I just on a new floor. on a new floor. There's a whole new world here. I guess. The door closed and the door open. Very weird. But yeah, so that's one reason. But the other reasons are that that specific specimen that we see, Mm -hmm. who is affectionately named Mr. Blobby and oh. resides in an, uh, a museum collection in oh. Australia. You can actually go see Mr. Blobby? I don't if you're know a if you can. Yeah, if you're okay. a researcher, I believe that you can go see Mr. Blobby. It's not on public display. Yeah. Museum collections are not just like what is on display, but they have lots of other animals in the museum that people use for research as well. So this museum specimen has been preserved in ethanol for a very long time. Gotcha. And that is something that will, you know, alter its coloration like the texture of it, its structure a little bit. And also it has like this parasitic copepod just like sitting in its mouth. So it looks like it's drooling. Oh. So all of these things <laughs> make Mr. Blobby look kind of gross, but that's not what they look like in the deep sea. So they are a type of flathead sculpin and they look a lot more normal than you would initially expect them to. Va09 <laughs> on YouTube asks, are there fish with proto lungs still swimming around? Oh. There are Lungfish. Lungfish. And they're so cool. There's a couple different species living in like South America, Africa, and Australia. Um, That's all over the place. Yeah, I think there's really only three species, like one in each place. I but are they all related? That's a really good question. Yeah, who would know? I, Why would you know that off the top of your head? I don't know the answer to that question. <laughs> you would assume so, but they also look really different. So like, okay. I think the African lungfish is a lot more like hefty and has like some hefty fins. And then uh, I think maybe it's the South American one. Like its fins look so like wispy and thin and like little <laughs> spindly legs. Like man forgot leg day. I don't know. It's very funny. Does man use leg day for legs? Do they walk? I don't think that they do. Oh, okay. They don't look like they would be able to. <laughs> <laughs> Why do they have lungs if they don't go on land? They can breathe air. So they can breathe through their gills and like any other fish, but they can also breathe air. And so sometimes in like, during like the dry season, water in their like lake or whatever will be oh. not at the levels it should be. Uh -huh. And then they just kind of like hibernate in like the mud and they just like breathe air. And it also helps when they are, like they can go up to the surface and breathe air right, when if, the water has like really low oxygen right, concentration. Right. Okay, I gotcha. That makes, I don't know. I was like, well, if you have lungs, you must also be like a mud skipper that like walks around on the 
land sometimes. You'd think, you would think. But that's not how they be. They Instead, they are using that in order to live in anoxic water and to hibernate in mud. I just am kind of stuck on the fact that there there is a reason to get lungs that isn't about living on land. Like, yeah. that makes total sense to me now that I've heard it, but mm-hmm. I have never been exposed to that idea. Never really. It's not... Yeah, you'd think that, like, okay, we're moving to go on to land, so we have to be able to breathe air, but it's right. just like, no, we are able to go on land because we developed the ability to breathe air. Then we did that as total fish. As Yes, as, if, like, fish yeah. fish. Oh, my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so excited for this one. Why do flounders have everything on one side? Ah! Well, I understand why. I don't really understand how. Flounders and like other flatfishes are uh-huh. born, they're larvae, and I say larvae because they go through a metamorphosis of sorts. Fish do this. Yes. No one knows that fish do this. Yes. It's not all of them, but some yeah. of them metamorphose. And so this one, they start looking like a completely normal fish. Like eyes on both sides looking just very yeah. fishy. Partway through their development, one of the eyes starts to migrate to the other side of the head. And then they just kind of flatten laterally, and then they just oh swim God. sideways with their eyes on one side of their head. Wild. I just don't understand it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, like, what you got to know is I understand why this would happen, because it's extremely useful if you're laying on the ground all the time to, like to still and... have... Oh, yeah. Because they lay on the ground. They like lay... that. The, most of the time they spend on They're the ground. They're sideways, and their eyes are like this. Laying, laying on the ground, and they're looking up. And it's good to still be able to have binocular vision in mm-hmm. that situation and not have one of your eyes facing down into the dirt. Yeah. The question is, and the answer to this question, I also kind of know, but the question is, how on earth does that happen? And the answer is, our body plans are controlled by a bunch of weird systems that decide where our hair goes and our eyes go and, like, put our body into the orders that they have. Mm -hmm. And these are very ancient genes, but they, like, changes deep in the thing can allow for, like, what looks like a really massive change with only pretty subtle changes. Right. The Beck's best example of this is that they took the gene for a, I think, a rabbit's eye, and they put it in the part of a fly's genome that controls its hindquarters, so its butt. These are, it's a rabbit and a fly. Yeah, I'm Not really, closely related to each other. I feel like I know where this is going in a very uncomfortable And day. the fly grew a fly eye on its butt. A fly eye, not a rabbit eye. Because well, it wasn't a gene for coding for how to build a rabbit eye. It was just it was a the gene placement for of eyes. The, the, yeah, that, it's like this is where eyes go. Oh my god, that's so weird. And so like body plan is like is deep, 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 deep in the genome. It's it's like it's like worm stuff. For the most part, fixed, but not always. It seems. Yeah, I mean, you get these situations. So like, tre- tre- like everything on land has four limbs and a head. Right. Like all vertebrates on land. Mm-hmm. Um, so liz- lizards, birds, people. Uh, amphibians. Like, so you get a tail sometimes, mm-hmm. but, like, a lot of those tetrapods have five fingers. Yes. But some of them have three, some have one, some have two, some have seven. Like, so that can change. Yeah. But, like, the the sort of, like, base structure is very hard to change. Yeah. Uh, flatfish, wait, because flatfish, depending on which species you have, will determine, usually, which eye moves. Oh. So you can have right-eyed and left-eyed flatfish. Ah! Based on <laughs> which way they're facing when their eyes are, like, above their mouth. Um, and also, they have a bone called a urohyle, which other fish have as well. But usually in other fish, it's just, like, a plate like this. Like, it's just a solid. Mm-hmm. But in flatfish, this urohyle is shaped more like a C in most cases. And it allows them to, like, shunt water between their two gill chambers. Oh. And so I think the idea is... Potentially to be able to like shoot water out of the blind side to be able to like fluidize the sand a bit so that they can bury easier. Oh, that makes total sense because I've seen them do that and I'm like, how are you so good at that? Yeah. It's like you turn the sand into a liquid. Yeah, like their undulations and potentially also like a water jet. Yeah. It's so cool though, is it not? Like they can move water between their. Yeah, yeah, it's like breathing breathing water through your nose and spitting it out the side of your mouth. Yeah. (laughs) That'd be like if you could move air from like your right lung to your left lung. Oh, yeah. That feels so much more uncomfortable actually. But also, there's like a hole in the side of your chest and it's just like. You should see a doctor if that's the case. (laughs) Okay. If I fall into a river with piranhas, will they eat me or ignore? me i have no idea i assume it depends on how hungry they are i think that it more depends on 
whether or not you are, are dead or dying. Oh! So, piranha are... Why would they care? Because if you are larger than them and healthy, you can kill them. And they know that. Oh, yeah. I could kill, like, one of them. For Ooh, sure. Yeah. If they're... Th- I feel like they're not necessarily in... Well, I guess I'm not going to say they're not in groups of, like, 100. Because, like, that's what I assume. But I don't, I don't know that for sure. In my experience, like, I worked with piranhas at... Piranha, whatever is the plural here, at an aquarium. And I would stick like the cleaning instrument in to like get uh-huh. the algae off the window. I would see them until I put the, until the instrument touched the water and they would disappear to the other side. Mm. They, I was like, if I put my arm in here, like, are they going to eat me? No, they, I did not see them for like the next 20 minutes. They'd be so scared. They're like, I don't know what that thing is, but it's bigger than me and it looks strong. So I'm going to leave it alone. All right. But yeah. Piranhas are super cool. They get a bad reputation just like sharks. Um, but they're very cool animals. They're important to their ecosystems, and we should give them a bit more love and respect. Do you think it sometimes it's like a branding thing? Piranha is such a great word, and it does it, it does seem a little bit intimidating. I think that we associate the word with being intimidating. Yeah. Because we know what the animal is, sure. and we have these associations because of the media. The first moment that we were talking, you talked about white sharks. Yes. And I was like, do you mean great white sharks? And you were like, yeah, we just call them white sharks because there's no lesser white shark. Yeah. And I was like, great point. And then you said uh, that that, like great white shark is kind of like, to me, like, why do we have to make it sound so scary? Yeah. And I was like, I don't think it's the name. (laughs) I don't think it's the word great that's making great white sharks scary. No, probably not. But like, white sharks can be scary. And I completely understand that. Especially if you are a surfer yeah be aware of their prey items and when their prey items are around Mm. but i my thing was that like i don't know we ended up having a conversation of like we should call it the white shark because it doesn't deserve the title great and then we landed on actually what if we just start calling all sharks great because we don't need to (laughs) we don't need to bring one down to bring all the other ones up bring everybody up it's the great tiger shark it's the great thresher shark it's the great maker shark they're all great they're all great great. and we appreciate their ecosystem services (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> do we want to do one more question yeah let's do one more question one more question Ooh, what cool tricks have people taught fish this is oh. a question from ariel mccarthy 4892 can i tell you that i feel and I, you're gonna tell me i'm wrong and i appreciate this that fish are dumb yeah no i'm gonna tell you you're wrong yeah i understand why like people think that but they are not dumb working at an aquarium you see all the things of like what you can teach a fish and like how smart they are. Um, target training is a big one, which helps like people that work in an aquarium get access to the animal either to like feed them or do like a checkup so that you don't have to like chase them around a huge exhibit, mm. especially if the animal is like really big and like right. strong. Like when you're trying to do a checkup on a shark, if maybe there's like an injury or like maybe it's not feeding well or something like that, you want to do a checkup on it, you're not going to wrestle a shark. You want the <laughs> shark to just be like, oh, I recognize that target. That means I'm supposed to swim over there and sit there patiently. Mm -hmm. Great. I have been able to teach guitar fish how to do this. And they're very cool. They look like guitars. But it's like half ray, half shark looking thing. They're very cool. I love them. I have a tattoo of them on my arm. They are so smart. And you can see even like just, I trained three of them. And even just within those three, you could see their different like, I don't want to anthropomorphize too much, but like for lack of a better word, personalities. Sure. Basically what I did is I like made a target and then I put it in the water and anytime any of the three guitar fish showed interest in it, I would feed them. Mm -hmm. Then over time, I would make it like my, I guess, qualifications for how close they have to get to it. I would shorten that distance until they basically are touching the target when you feed them. They then start to associate it with food. So you stick the target in and... The names were Fender, Gibson, and Kramer, which I think is very funny. (laughs) Fender would just make like a beeline right for the target. She's like, I know what that means. I want food. And she would come and it was great. Gibson is like kind of middle ground where she would just be like, yeah, okay, I see it. I'll be there in a minute. And then Kramer was just like, I'm still kind of scared. I don't know. But I know that you'll feed me. So like, give me a few minutes and then I'll be over there. It's fine. And they did this with like a file fish and they were like, throw a little hula hoop in the water and he would come up to the middle of the hula hoop and wait for food. Hmm. It was very cute. Yeah. No, I saw them do this at the Monterey Bay Aquarium with a mola mola. And it just like came over and then they had these like tubes of like frozen shrimp and jellyfish. 
Did they just like, like shoot it at it? Mixed with agar, I think. And they just, yeah. I, and it was just like, oh, wah, 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 wah. I, They're the most ridiculous. They fish. look, I don't want to call them dumb, but they do look dumb. They act dumb too. Um, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. For having me on your YouTube channel. Oh my gosh, of course. Yes, thank you for joining. Thank you for answering fish questions yeah. with me. What a blast. What a blast. Where can they find you, Hank? I uh, am on Hank's channel, Hank Green One on TikTok. A Hank Green on everywhere else, and then Vlog Brothers and SciShow and Crash Course. Did someone take Hank Green on TikTok? Yeah, mm. before I got there. See? I actually really like that I'm Hank Green one. I think that's pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it seem suspicious yeah. until you get to your page and it's like, no, that guy's legit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Thank you for joining us today.